All right. Now, um, in last lesson, we talked about um, church history just really, really briefly, mostly just looking at the different dates of the earliest church in the first century, really blowing through everything past that. Um, but it is important to understand these letters in their context, okay? Um, a few things I, I kind of left out. Um, Paul's thorn in the flesh that he mentions came about sometime around in 43 AD. Um, we don't really know what it is, um, but it was sometime around that. Around then. Um, also, I, I mentioned the destruction of, of the Qumran uh, community, which was, you know, an Essene community, um, mon monastic, if you will, um, and and I didn't really give the clarification there. Uh, the, there was a Jewish rebellion that started sometime around like 66 or 67. I don't really remember exactly when it started, but anyways, um, and eventually Qumran was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, and it ended with uh, Masada being destroyed um, in 73. Um, so Jerusalem was destroyed in 70, Masada was destroyed in 73, um, and in fact, in Masada, Josephus records that um, a bunch of a bunch of uh, the Jewish rebels had committed suicide. Um, I want to say it was over 900. Um, I'm not positive about the number, but uh, regardless, um, and then it, it ended pretty much, you know, in 73. Um, and and that's also why the Christian church fled from Jerusalem to Pella was because of, of just mounting tensions and things were just getting a little bit too eesh. Um, also, I mentioned that Peter and Paul um, had a had a disagreement. This is probably what happened. So Peter leaves from Jerusalem and he probably eventually wound up in Antioch, where or Syrian Antioch, okay, where Paul also was. And then, uh, from there, uh, he probably, uh, more than likely, um, uh, had a conflict w w with Paul, uh, or, yeah, with Paul. And then from there, he more than likely, you know, did his thing somewhere, and then eventually ended up back in Jerusalem for the Apostolic Council. Now, by the Apostolic Council, uh, Paul and Peter seem to have not been alienated anymore. So, we don't really know all the details, but we know that Whatever it was, you know, they, they had that conflict there in Syria and Antioch. And then by the time that Peter was back in Jerusalem, uh, he was back on the same page about the law. Um, so whatever happened between then and there. Uh, and then from there, he eventually ended up in Rome. Um, whether he went to Rome and then came back for the Apostolic Council, I mean, I, I don't know. I really don't. Um, but um, also, to really... To really um, if you guys are having a hard time understanding these different views and stuff like that, I encourage you to look up From Pentecost to Patmos by Craig Blomberg. Really a great resource, um, easy to understand. And I also did want to make, make reference to the fact that, um, as uh, uh, Justo Gonzalez um, says, I think it was him. Um, yeah, I believe it, it was him. Um, that Early Christianity was largely spread by, by the trades, um, people going on trade, not so much missionaries. Um, obviously, we know about you know the missionaries like Paul and Peter and Philip and these people going out and doing these things, but um, a lot of it was spread just through uh, through trade, through the traders and whatnot. So that's interesting. Um, so today we're going to be looking at James, Galatians, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, Thessalonians, and Paul's uh, first three major uh, missionary trips or journeys. Um, and we'll start with James. Now, uh, for this lesson, I will be hiding my um, my little webcam thing there um, because we're going to be looking at maps, and I don't want it to get in the way. Okay, so James was written by uh, uh, Jesus's brother James. Now, um, let's clarify a few things in. The in, towards the beginning of Acts, um, there's a James who is killed. This is one of the twelve. This is not the brother of James or Jesus. I mean, and James was not one of the twelve. Okay, um, the other James was one of the twelve, and people have kind of confused the true, the two. Jesus's brother James probably did not get saved until or 
convert or whatever you want to say until um, G after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, I think verse 7 or so, uh, makes reference of Jesus making a specific um, appearance to James. Now, uh, after that, it mentions that James is with the brethren, and, and, and it seems to imply that he is um, he is now a believer. Um, so, it is not the James that was killed in the beginning of Acts when Peter was arrested. Um, and so then people have asked, well, why is why is the writing style so smooth then for for such a per, for such a person? I mean, he was just a carpenter's son. Well, there's there's two possible um, solutions that don't require you to um, downgrade the authority of scripture. I mean, uh, you know, some people would immediately say, okay, so that absolutely proves that um, James was written by someone who wasn't actually, um, or maybe later, or by, I think they call it Sida. I can't remember the word, but it basically means um, um, where somebody else wrote and pretended to be James. Um, Pseudepigrapha or something like that. I, I forget the word. Um, but anyways, it, well, not necessarily. Okay, the first result is something called a, an, an amanuensis. Okay, um, forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. Um, basically, what this is is someone who would have written it for him and helped him to make it be more polished. But he would have been the, still the writer. Just this person would have been the person who actually penned it, or maybe just uh, um, polished it over. Um, also, in considering the fact that Greek was strongly um, emphasized, uh, even in Palestine, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that James would have been familiar enough with, with Greek and, and to be able to write the, the epistle of James. Um, obviously, uh, Greek was one of the one of the more spoken um, things, uh, languages. Um, even the Old Testament was, was, was in, the, in Greek for, for the, um, for at this time. So, I mean, as far as we know, the large majority of the Jews were probably forgetting um, Hebrew, maybe still knew, you know, Aramaic and whatnot, but, but we're still um, forgetting um, forgetting some of that. Um, and, and so it seems more than likely that, that at least Jesus probably spoke mostly in Greek throughout his ministry. Uh, he probably spoke in Aramaic too, but I mean... Um, and sometimes, for instance, when he's on the cross, you know, he, he says something in Aramaic, and people around him don't even know what he's saying. And they thought he was calling for Elijah. See what I mean? And, 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 and it seems very possible that um, Greek was a big enough deal for even Jews like James and Jesus to be very familiar with it and even be able to write in it. Um, his audience was... Um, was Christian Jews that were dispersed in, in the Syria area, judging from the content of the book. Um, it could have been written more broadly, um, or also to Christians uh, around Palestine, closer to, but it seems most likely that it was the Syrian area. Um, although, once again, we can't write off other areas. It says to the, to the uh, dispersed Jews, so, I mean, obviously that's at least implies outside of uh, traditional Israel, um, but maybe doesn't necessarily mean throughout all the known world. Um, it was written probably in about 45, making it the earliest earliest of the Christian writings uh, that we have um, preserved today. Um, the context is one that um, I, I don't I don't know who originally uh, um, suggested this, but Craig Blomberg uh, suggested it in his uh, from Pentecost to Patmos. And that's this, that the, 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 the audience was poor and exploited Christian, Jewish Christians, um, who were obviously who were day laborers, uh, who were persecuted by two groups, the, the wealthy landowners and the Jews. Because once again, they were, um, they were Christians now. Now, it is important to note that in the early church, um, a, Jew, Christians were not seen as a different sect. At least not at first. It took some while before that was that happened. They they thought of themselves as Jews, just with the fullness of the revelation. Um, so and then also uh, so so they have the wealthy landowners persecuting them and the Jews persecuting them, um, and that seems to be the, the the main the main thrust of the argument there. Not necessarily that all of them are poor, but that those who um, are poor are having maybe a hard time with this, and those who um, have the means to give. Um, should uh, use their use their um, their giving wisely. 
So some special characteristics is there's a strong um, strong allu um, allusions to the Sermon on the Mount, um, as recorded in Matthew, and to Leviticus 19. Um, just really plays off of those two a lot. Um, read through Matthew, I think it's 5 through 8, and you'll really start to see a lot of the resounding themes from James. Um, and uh, in Leviticus um, 19, a lot of the things that, that are covered there, James also um also discuss, uh, uh, discusses. Um, also, uh, throughout James, there's there's a lot of uh, catchwords used. Um, in other words, he'll say something, and then that'll launch him into what he says in the next verse, which will launch him into what he says in the next verse. Obviously, not every verse is like this, but a good majority of them have this. Um, <clears throat> um, one example is, uh, and it starts out in verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Then he goes to, let perseverance finish its works, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then he goes to, if any of you lacks wisdom. So, I mean, it, it kind of piggybacks on each other. Um, also, um, lastly, there, there seems to be a strong emphasis on wisdom literature, uh, a lot of uh, maybe Jewish-type Jewish, Jewish -type writing, writing um, which, which has caused many to believe that it was just like maybe um, random Proverbs almost like, like uh, the New Testament version of Proverbs. Uh, this is not necessarily so. Um, he could have just been using this style to, um, to uh, relate more to his audience. Obviously, you can, you can read more about this, and, and there's many people who have written about it, um, and more qualified people than me, so I'll just skip past that. Um, but it does seem to have a strong wisdom literature influence. Um, and although the writing style is different than Paul, it does seem most likely that this is written to specific people um, with specific problems. Um, so the main theme of James seems to be to encourage the weary Christian to overcome evil with good. Um, it seems like James's audience uh, is largely just getting frustrated, wanting to quit, just wanting to throw in the towel, getting mad at each other, getting mad at other people. Now. Remember, there, there, there were two main pu main groups uh, of Jews that, that um, James's audience may have been struggling with. The first is called the Zealots. Now, these are people who um, were kind of uh, the rebels. You know, um, we can remake things through rebellion. You know, overthrow the powers, overthrow this. We can um, rise above. They were kind of the militant group, okay. But then there were the Essenes. They were they were more like the monks, okay. Uh, they were very. Uh, they, they believed in and there was no there was no chance for the world is too sinful, so they separated themselves from it. Um, and in James, we see kind of a balance between those two. Like, don't separate yourself from the world and become pacifistic, but also don't become, you know, um, embittered and rise against these people. Um, and, and you can kind of see that all throughout, and, and you can definitely see um, his audience shown um, throughout. Just the different quarrels that are coming out, the different squabbles and whatnot. So some difficult passages of James. Um, one is verse uh, verse 6 of chapter 1. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, uh, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Now, um, first off, he didn't say um, to ask for anything. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God in verse 5. Okay, So he's not necessarily saying that you ask anything of God and he'll give it to you. No, he says specifically wisdom. And later on he talks about, if any of you are wise, let him show it. Meaning that wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom is maybe knowledge and application. Maybe uh, knowledge that, that actually has feet. Um, um, wisdom is more of, of your demeanor and how you do things, discernment, that kind of stuff. I already wrote blogs about this, so if you're interested, you can check out my blog. It's in the details below. But... Um, um, what that word doubting means is basically without hesitation or arguing with yourself. Um, especially, it's in, it's in the passive there, and, and once again, it, I'm not really going to get too much into that. Um, but could easily um, could easily come out to, to to be translated like that. And as far as with doubt, remember, uh, without I mean, sorry, asking faith. Um, faith is trusting in God. It's not belief in God. It's trusting in God. So basically, whenever you ask something of the Lord. Don't argue with yourself. Don't hesitate. Go to the Lord and trust in Him for for whatever's going to happen. Not not that He'll answer you necessarily, but that He'll hear you and that he, and that He will do um, whatever His will is. Um, you know, we pray for a lot of things, and not everything's answered. Um, also, in two twenty four, um, different translations say it uh, around along the lines of without um, works you are not justified. Somewhere somewhere like that. Um, but the NIV says you see you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. 
Um, and all he's really saying here is that true faith produces works. You cannot possibly claim to have faith in God and then not have any feet with that faith. Okay, um, that is just simply belief in God, and I mean, even even demons believe in God. Uh, belief in God doesn't profit you anything. You have to trust. You have to. There has to be faith there, um, and obviously, faith, true faith requires repentance. Um, if you're living your own way, that's not true faith. Um, also, in chapter four, verse one, it says, "What qual what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you?" See, a lot of times people blame either God or Satan for this or that. But throughout the book of James, we see him constantly saying about our responsibility for that. That we can't just say, oh, God tempted me, or God did this, or whatever. Or, oh, Satan made me do it. Because he says, if you if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So once again, you, we can't blame on God or Satan. Whenever we pray for anybody, we're not we're not casting out demons of, of this and demons of that. I mean, unless the person is demon-possessed. But otherwise... Um, we are we are we are praying um, um, for their submission to the Lord, um, and then we see from verses two and three that not all prayers are answered. He says here, um, you um, you do not have because you do not ask God, and then at the end of verse three he says, you don't receive um, when you ask you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives uh, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Uh, and honestly, think about many of the times that you pray. How many times it's just for something that you want, not necessarily what's best or what God wants. Um, and then in 5, uh, 13 through 20, um, I'm not really going to get into this, but um, if if this is a, 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 um, a letter that is very much so um, not just random bits of wisdom, but actually has a guided um, structure to it, it seems very likely that um, the prayer of faith that is mentioned in chapter in verses 13 uh, then through 20 um, is talking about a spiritual restoration and not a physical healing. Um, this would make more sense in light of a few things. First off, um, James is talking about you know he starts off the letter consider it pure joy keep going don't don't give up um, you know you shouldn't do this keep going keep going and then out of nowhere he throws this curveball about about being being healed. Now there's a few things. First off. If he's talking about a physical healing, this doesn't really make sense as he doesn't really that wasn't really touched on anywhere else, and it also doesn't make sense in the analogy he uses of, of uh, um, Elijah, and then also verses 9 through 19 and 20 don't really fit in at all, um, and and it makes it seem like um, first off that our healing is always guaranteed. Um, it, Craig Blomberg actually has a solution to this. He says, well, no, because he has assumed that we've read earlier on where it says. Um, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and, and do this or that, which is possible. Okay, I'm not saying it's definite that he's talking about spiritual healing. I'm saying it's it's very likely because it kind of does. What happens when we get persecuted? We reach a place of just complete apathy. We, we back off the faith. Sometimes we even become apathetic because of our own sins. So what does it say? Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders. Um, also, there's this thing called chiasm. Okay, that's basically, we talked about this in the Old Testament, but it starts out, is anyone among you in trouble? And then it goes to, is anyone happy? And then it goes to, is anyone among you sick? Now, if this is chiasm, we can know that sick means more about in trouble, as in, um, are you um, distraught? Are you in a place of, of weakness? Um, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. And so some people have said, well, it says call the elders of the church. This must mean that... Um, that uh, they're unable to go. Well, no, not necessarily. Many times in the New Testament, somebody calls someone even even though they're they're able to reach them. Um, I mean, read through the Gospels for one. Um, and as far as the anointing with oil, I mean, it seems it could mean a lot of different things. But at this time, it seems very unlikely that they would have thought that it had a, a, a medicinal purposes. Um, it seems more likely that it was just an anointing in the way of um, um, uh, kind of like when Jesus says about about the um, when you fast, you know, wash yourself off, anoint yourself with oil. Um, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. See, once again, um, just kind of the flow here. If they have sinned, you know, this, this um, literally is even if they have created a sin, uh, they will be forgiven. Now, some would point to Jesus' ministry where he raised up the person who was um, 
who was sick, and, and before he did that, he forgave them of their sins. But I don't know, that seems to be a little bit of a stretch. Um, there's just not sufficient enough evidence to say that necessarily. It's a possible solution, just not a definite one. Um, it could just as easily mean, um, even if they are in this place of despair because of what they have done, they will be forgiven. Um, therefore, confess your sins. And so now he moves, moves to how to prevent this from happening. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Once again, when, whenever we continue to live in a sin, there's just this, this, this um, deadness that comes. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Um, now, obviously, that verse could mean that could mean either way there on that. Um, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Once again, seeming to imply that he's talking about a, a physical healing. The heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Um, I mean, a spiritual, I'm sorry, a spiritual healing. And then it goes to verse 19 and 20, which kind of just summates everything here. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. See, if he's talking about a spiritual healing, this all meshes together. If he's not, well then, um, it really does, and it's just kind of random things thrown in there. Also, why would he use Elijah, and why would he specifically mention the rain and the crops that are then pr produced forward after that? Um, and also, if he's talking about um, uh, physical healing, that would mean that there it really is no no um, direct um, uh, pattern of this le uh, of this letter. It's just random stuff thrown in. Uh, once again, a possible solution, just not necessarily the only solution. Um, and once again, that would then close up the letter, which is exactly where he started the letter. People who are in pers persecution, let pers perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete. But what happens if, if you if you if you fail on that? So I mean, what happens if you get, get tired of that? What happens if if um, you do teach out of, out of selfish ambition? What happens if you if you don't keep a bridle on your on your mouth? What happens if, if you do boast about tomorrow? What happens if you do um, uh, strive after after riches? What happen, it happens if you do um, become impatient and and desire destruction for other people? See, what I mean, it just seems like that kind of sums it up. However, um, there is still. Plenty of, of proof that it could be a, about physical healing either. It's best to not take, take too much of a, of a for sure post on this. But if he is talking about physical healing, it's important to note that it should not mean that every healing is saved. It will, every physical healing will be, um, every physical need will be answered. Um, so, um, James writes this, and you know, as much as people think, James and Paul actually don't contradict in what they say, and we'll talk about that in Galatians, but first off, this is Paul's first missionary journey, okay? This is about 44 to 46, somewhere in there, and as you can see, it starts over here in Antioch, and then he goes to Seleucia. Now, this is Syrian Antioch. There's another Antioch over here, and there's another Antioch, although I don't remember where it's at. Um, so he goes down here to Seleucia, down from there to Salamis, and Paphos on Cyprus, then he goes up to Perga, and then over to Antioch here, Iconium here, and then uh, down to Lystra, and then Derby, and then back the way he came to uh, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, or this Antioch, then Perga. But this time he goes over to Atelia, and then down and around back to Seleucia, and then back to Antioch. Okay? Um, so that's his first missionary journey. Um, and sometime after this, he writes Galatians, but this is before his second missionary journey and before the Apostolic Council, okay? So this was, uh, Galatians was written by Paul. Um, it was written probably to southern Galatia. If you look on this map here, um, he really went to southern Galatia. He didn't go to this northern bit over here. Um, that's important. Um, obviously, we're not going to get into why it's that important in this class, but, I mean, for more advanced classes, that's kind of important. Um, so he was more talking to ethnic Galatians, not so much um, um, the more uh, area of, of Galatia. Um, the, the date that he wrote was about 48, um, 47 maybe, um, just right before the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem that's mentioned in Acts chapter 15. Um, the context is a, there's, there's becoming a strong tension between Jews and Christians. Um, as Christians are becoming a more um, defined sect, um, separate from, from, from the Jews, and the Jews are kind of having a fit about this. Um, and so there, there's this rising tension, um, and Christianity is developing, and so, so people are coming to this 
kind of question is of where does the law fit in? See, the Old Testament hasn't just been a problem for the new church. It was a problem for the old church, too. They, they didn't understand where the middle ground was. Um, how much of the law, if any of it, do we have to do in order to be saved? Um, so when Paul says we are saved by faith, um, I'm sorry, by, by grace through faith, um, and this not of our own so that no one could brag, he's obviously not saying that that means that you can live however you want. Okay? He's just trying to ease away from the idea of the Judaizers who said that you had to do this to be saved and you had to do this to be saved. Um, but all one, one actually requires is, is, is true faith in Christ. Now, once again, if you have true faith, works will follow. So, And Paul talks about that in Galatians when he contrasts the works of the Spirit with the works of the flesh. Um, so some special characteristics are, first off, it's an apologetic letter. Um, he uh, he kind of defends the faith. He he, he um, you know he was just there on his first missionary journey. And what is he saying? Are you already abandoning this? Are you already you know uh, changing out this gospel for a new gospel? I was just there. I'm surprised at how quickly this is ta this is happening. Um, so it's, so it's very strong apologetic meaning in the defense of the faith, not so much an apology, but in the defense of the faith. Um, Another uh, strong characteristic of it is it, it talks a lot about the Jewish law, or the Old Testament, um, if you want to call it that. Um, not so much works in general, just specifically um, the Jewish works, the, the Jewish law. And so when he's talking about the law throughout here, he's, he's talking about, um, he's talking about uh, the, the Jewish law. Um, and so this was before the Apostolic Council, as afterwards he wouldn't have needed to write an epistle. Um, and you can tell just from where he leaves off in Galatians that um, it had not been resolved yet in the Apostolic Council. Obviously, he would have appealed to that um, if that was a factor, um, but he didn't. So we can safely assume that it was it was before um, his second missionary journey, which would have placed it before the Apostolic Council. Um, so the main theme is the true gospel and the law. He constantly talks about even if an angel himself gives you an, a different gospel than the, one that, than the one that we gave you, it is to be accursed. Um, so then he talks about, um, also uh, strongly talks about the law and, and where Christian uh, works come into play. Okay, So James and Galatians really have a lot um, in common. The only difference is people get a little bit off track with what Paul's trying to understand ra rather than understanding it in the context, um, separating it from that. Um, so just some different um, different difficult passages with Galatians. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11 mentions um, him opposing Peter. Um, however, by the Apostolic Council, they're restored again. So um, it seems more than likely after he, he talked about talked to Peter, not, not talked about him, talked to Peter, that he initially rejected what Paul was saying, but then eventually came around, um, and that they were somehow restored before the Apostolic Council, but that's not recorded. So we can't know too well what... Um, what what's um, what the exact chronology of events is there? Um, it seems more than likely that if Peter had repented, that he would have uh, recorded that in his letter to the Galatians. Um, in uh, three nineteen twenty four and five fourteen, we see um, the purpose of the law. The first um, purpose that Paul gives is in because people often ask, well, then why do we even have the law? Um, since we're sa not saved by doing those works, well. Paul talks about that in 3.19. He says, Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. So you see there, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. Okay? Um, also, it had been given, verse 24, and you can pick up a commentary and do more, more in depth on this. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Okay, and then there's a second purpose, and then in 5.14, he mentions a third purpose. Um, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. See, so we have three three purposes there for the law um, that I really don't have time to get too much into. Um, so anyways, in 5.13, um, we have a good, uh, a good in-between here for becoming too legalistic, um, Hold on, let me just read it. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. 
there's there's the there's the not being um, legalistic, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. There's the not being lawless. See, so oftentimes, rather serve one another humbly in love. Oftentimes, what people do is they go to one extreme or the other. Either they live however they want, or they try to conform everybody to the to the book of, of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. But you can't get tattoos. You can't do this. You can't do that. Um, or they go once again go to the other extreme. I can do whatever I want. I'm saved by grace. Well. Once again, not really the case. In fact, he goes on to say about the things that they should be doing. Now, if 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 salvation is not by not by works but by faith, why does he mention it all? Because once again, true faith produces works. Um, so it's more than likely this is where this is where he's talking about here: Derby, Lystra, Iconium, that area there in the southern Galatia. Um, so then uh, the, they have the Apostolic Council, which is what. Let me get my pointer here. Um, so he starts out in, in Antioch, which is probably where he um, where he um, disagreed with Peter, and then he goes down here to Jerusalem at, for the Apostolic Council. Then he comes back up, and then from there he leaves on his second missionary journey, he goes whoop, up around to Tarsus here to Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, um, way over here to Troas, then here to ne Neapolis. Then Philippi, then um, Amphipolis, then Apolli Apol <laughs> Apollonia, then Berea, then Th I'm sorry, then Thessalonica, um, then Berea. Sorry, I didn't see that little line there. Um, and then way down here through Achaia to Athens, and then Corinth, um, and then Cancrea, where she sells from there, to Ephesus here, uh, past Miletus. Down through, down past Patmos, down through here, past Rhodes, all the way down to Caesarea, then Jerusalem, and then back to Antioch. Um, and this was around 48 or 49 or so to about 52 or so, 51 somewhere in there. Um, so you can definitely see um, see the different development there. Now this is supposedly when when Cor the Corinthian church was founded, which which Paul did that. Um, at least that's you know popular theory, like. Peter supposedly started the Roman Church, um, and then he goes over here, here to Ephesus. Now he's going to write this the next letter. He's going to write it is going to be the Thessalonican uh, correspondence. Um, so uh, that takes us to First Thessalonians, um, which was obviously written to Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica was a, a very large um, city. It was the largest um, city and actually the capital of Macedonia. Um, it was a major port and um, a major port city. And it was a big stop on the highway, um, so it, 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 it was a very kind of a, a big deal of a city. Great thing to get the church going on there, as then the people who, um, you know, because it was so big, they would have gotten a lot of through traffic, a lot of easier, a lot easier to witness um, when you're shouting on the highways than when you're shouting on the hills. Um, so uh, um, the uh, why he's writing. Um, it's weird. In, 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 in Thessalonians, Paul praises them more than in any other New Testament epistle. Okay, he, I mean, he, the whole thing is like a, 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 a praise, 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 the whole way through. Um, well, by the way, it was written about 50, uh, about uh, two or so years after um, Galatians, while he was probably, um, um, well, I'll leave it at that. Probably around 50 is, is a pretty good bet. Um, and then, um, but as far as why he's writing, you know, besides um, to say all these different things, he addresses a few lifestyle issues um, with this and with the Second Thessalonians, and then he also um, addresses Christ's return. Um, um, it seems like maybe a, lot, a large portion of his purpose is to encourage the church. Um, but anyways, um, so then uh, we see uh, a main emphasis is Christ is coming soon. So, so a few difficult passages would be 4.16, uh, where he says, uh, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, um, obviously this contradicts Jehovah's Witness. There will be a very visible coming. Uh, same as Jesus left vis uh, visibly and physically, he will come back visible, visibly and physically. Um, 
and then 19 through 20, you know, sometimes some things will happen and what causes us to become kind of dead into the spirit. Maybe people misuse it or maybe um, we don't like the people who use it or whatever. But whatever it is, sometimes we don't make way for the gifts. Uh, maybe we get too large of a church and we just kind of um, try to make everything scheduled and it breaks our schedule. Uh, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Um, so uh, as you can see, just not, not a whole lot of room for... for confusion on this epistle it's kind of easy to understand and then so thing, second thessalonians um if you notice he doesn't really use that much um time to warm up to them like he did in first thessalonians which has caused some people pause caused them to ask well why didn't he lead into it for the same with the same way like he did um in first thessalonians well um it was probably a correspondence back and forth written pretty close to the first thessalonians and if that, that's the case, then there really would be no need. Um, it would have just hopped right back into it. Um, for more on this, once again, read Pentecost of Patmos. Uh, Blomberg does a great job of, of just contrasting the different um, ideas there. Um, it was written probably around 51 or so, pretty pretty close to when the first Thessalonians were written. Um, now, the context seems to be kind of the Greek dualism that started really getting into the church in the 50s and so and on. It, then later, um, it, it's uncertain where Gnostic um, Gnosticism got going, and we don't even know um, when it when it started or whatnot, because it's so wrapped up with Greek thought. Greek had this idea of dualism, where where the where the body and the spirit were just two complete different things. You know, the flesh was evil, spirit is good, um, and and obviously Paul he writes a lot to to get them to out out of this kind of um, um, pre Gnostic thought. Um, and 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 singing the Thessalonians, it seems like that's kind of what's taken place here. Um, as in the end of singing the Thessalonians, it talks about the working and eating um, there in chapter three. Um, so some special characteristics. It, it, um, I don't really want to get into this, but there's ample proof for singing the Thessalonians being written after First Thessalonians. Um, some people would try to switch it around, but all all the facts considered, there's no reason um, to believe that. Um, but anyways, uh, so the main theme seems to be, but not that soon. Yes, Jesus is coming soon, as he said in First Thessalonians, but in Second Thessalonians, it seems to be, but not that soon. These are some things that have to take place first. So in 2.2, 2, it says, um, Not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. And then later on in verse 15, he says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teaching which is passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And then in 317, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Now, it has been supposed that that um, maybe um, there were two, two ideas have been kind of brought forth. One is that there are people pretending to be Paul or someone pretending to be the, the church leaders. Another theory is that maybe they just misunderstood or the letter was taken out of context or something like that. Um, both are possible, um, especially if you start messing around with the Greek there, you see how, how possible that is. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, also, we see from 3.7 that Christ has not yet come. It's going in some spiritual way, but it's going to be a physical thing. But we also see the tension between the Antichrist atmosphere and the Antichrist. Okay, Yes, there's an Antichrist atmosphere in the world, but the Antichrist is not here yet um, doing his thing. In 3.7 it says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Um, I'm sorry, um, that's a typo. 2-7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. I, I'm, I am sorry about that 3-7 issue. Um, that should say 2-7. Um, sorry about that. So then in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, um, Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. Um, once again, unbalanced doctrine is causing an unbalanced living. Um, this idea of, of the spirit being absolutely good and the physical, physical being absolutely bad, you know, causes a lot of different um, things. And so there are some people who are overemphasizing the flesh. You know, Jesus uh, wasn't um, fully uh, human, so therefore only our, um, um, so therefore we need to do things to earn the rest of our salvation. 
I'm sorry, no, no. So therefore we can live however we want, but it, Jesus, or then some others would say that Jesus is not fully God, so therefore, um, oh, I'm saying this all wrong. Some say that Jesus, <laughs> uh, that Jesus is not fully human. Um, and with that being said, um, um, we are saved in spirit and our, and our body just doesn't really matter how we live. Then others people would say that he's not fully God, so we have to substitute that with um, the things that we do um, and Paul writes against both of these ideas, are the, which are very much um, dualistic uh, Greek um, ways of thinking. So Paul's third missionary journey, um, you can see he leaves from Antioch, where we left off in the, at, the, at the second missionary journey, goes up through here to here, all the way through, just like he did in the second one, over through. Except this time he goes to Ephesus, Okay, goes up through here to Troas here. Up and around to Neapolis, Philippi again, down here to Thessalonica again, Berea, down through here. But after he gets to Corinth, rather than selling through here, he goes back up through here, through Berea and Thessalonica, over to here to Philippi, um, and then through here. Except this time, after Troas, he goes down to here to Assus, rather than um, up through that way. Then he goes into uh, Mytilene, and then down through here. Um, down to uh, Miletus and Trigilium and then Patara. Okay, and then back down here through Tyre, Ptolemais, Caesarea, Jerusalem. So, I hope that that um, clarifies some stuff that's going on there. Um, I hope that I didn't make it too confusing. Um, if there's any questions, post them below. Um, next, we'll, next, we'll look at uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, Romans, first and second Corinthians, Romans, Jude, Acts, and Hebrews. Um, uh, but yeah, Thessal Thessalonian correspondence shows us, um, you know, that Jesus is coming soon, but not not yet. Um, there's no reason to believe that they were written um, too long after each other. In fact, the evidence seems to imply that they were written in that order, and that they were written right after each other. Um, and once again, Galatians talking about the purpose of the law and how the law fits. We're not trying to make people Jews. We're trying to make them Christians. Um, and and uh, then we talked about James. And the way that um, really balances faith and works um, and uh, just kind of the idea there. Um, if you have any questions, once again, uh, be, be sure and post them below. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this.